inspiration for this book probably came from a combination of a couple different areas. Um, years and years and years ago, I used to, it sounds really kind of stalkerish and crazy, but um, I used to follow this totally unknown singer-songwriter around the city. And I'm not particularly into music or live music, but I saw him one time and I was captivated. And all of a sudden, maybe a year into my stalking of him, he became overnight famous. His name is Gavin DeGraw. And we've heard of him, I know, which is wild, and I just think he's so phenomenally talented. I've never spoken a word to him in my life or met him, but um, I just really enjoyed seeing him in these divey places around New York, and that kind of got me thinking it's so interesting that that can happen. So it was that kind of combined with an interest in celebrity culture, for sure. I'm particularly interested in what it's like for the so-called civilian partner to, to, to be, you know, to be married to someone that famous, really what it's like from their perspective. So in, in Last Night at Chateau Marmont, it's, it's a story of fame and all the trappings that go with it, the sort of fabulous hotels and the posh parties and the glamour and the excitement, but it's also the sort of negative side of it. And it's, it's, it's Brooke's story. It's the story of the partner who's kind of left behind and left to deal with how to balance this new and unexpected world. I'll never forget with the Dove Wars Prada getting that first phone call from my editor at the time saying that they had just gotten the preview of the New York Times list and it was going to hit the list for its first week. And I remember I was standing at the corner of 86th and 3rd Avenue and I think I started a combination of sort of a shriek and a cry. And I, it was so astonishing for me because now when we see it, not that it's ever something you take for granted, but I think now you have an inkling a little bit before you get that first phone call of whether or not it's going to happen. You sort of follow the sales, you have an idea, you're super invested in it. And I was just so shocked by that. I was totally taken by surprise. No one had ever said that this was even a possibility. There may have been a touch of the experience with the Devil Wars Prada um, in terms of the overnight success of the book. Um, I think that Julian's experience in this book, Brooke and Julian's together, of how he finds this fame is, is just, it's a totally different level. You know, it's not, oh, I published a book that some people are reading. It's complete international rock stardom where they can't leave the apartment and they're just being stalked by paparazzi and they're reading these horrible things about themselves and people with ulterior motives are wanting a piece of them all the time and they're questioning their loyalty of their family and their friends and who's leaking things and um, that was definitely never my personal experience but um, it was easy to imagine in terms of you know what that could be like and how it seems like no level of celebrity or fame or the level of perks that go with it for me would ever be worth that price and um, for Brooke they're not either. After Prada, there was definitely, I felt, a lot of pressure for the book that was going to follow it. You know, and I think that's a pretty common experience for authors, that sophomore effort, and especially after an unexpected big book, you know, will it ever compete? Will it ever live up to that? But um, writing Everyone Worth Knowing was really difficult in that way, but sort of having written it was wonderful. You sort of put the second book behind you, and it set up a situation, you know, having having the Devil Wars Prada be as successful as it was, was a total dream come true. It was a dream come true for that actual book and for the movie that followed, which was so exciting. But it gave me an opportunity to be able to write full time and to write these kinds of books that I love. So, but after Prada came Everyone Worth Knowing, which was which was a really, really fun book to write, and it gave me a chance to look into a completely different part of subculture, this nightlife and PR world that I really had no exposure to, which was terrific, because I could sort of hang out in nightclubs under the guise of research until 3 a.m., and uh, that was really fun. And then after that, with Chasing Harry Winston, um, it was a total departure for me. It was the sort of the first book I wrote in the third person and from the perspective of three different characters and to be able to get inside the heads of three very different women who are all good friends was was challenging but really fun for me also. I definitely, you know, it's the oldest adage in the book, but you write what you know. So I definitely do mine my life and 
my girlfriend's lives <laughs> for information. And it's, it's, I try certainly and be discreet about it. There's no one-to-one -one basis where one character is based solely on someone I know in real life. Um, I don't think anyone would really love that. Um, but, you know, with just with last night at Chateau Marmont, I called my mom and I said, don't you love the scene where the mother is having tea with Brooke and they're talking about everything that happened at the Grammys and they're, you know, sitting on the couch and doesn't that remind you of us? And, you know, after she said, well, you know, we haven't had tea in two weeks, you know, after we got over the, the Jewish mother guilt of it. Um, she said, yeah, you know, I did like that, and I, I love being able to kind of read these books and see the little different parts of the places that you've been and, and the people that you know, so that you definitely draw from your own experiences. My fans are absolutely terrific. They are, I mean, that's personally the number one favorite thing for me about writing these books is reading the emails every day that they take the time to write and the range is incredible you know I get emails from seventh and eighth graders saying that I picked one of your books from my book report for this class and I want to ask you questions about it to women in their late 60s who say I read your books because they remind me of my daughter and I get a little glimpse into what maybe her life is like living in LA or New York or Atlanta or Philly and that's really neat for me too and then you get to, every now and then when you publish a new book, you get to kind of leave the solitude of your apartment and go to bookstores across the country and talk one-on-one -on -one with the readers, which is really, really incredible. And they share their stories too. You know, the, the bad boss stories are, people have some, there are a lot of people out there who could write a book about a bad boss. It's, it's remarkable, the things I've heard. But um, not just that, you know, they, they, they relate to a character and they feel as though you understand what they're going through. And if I were to reverse it as a reader, when, when I read a book, there's nothing I appreciate more is reading something where you feel like the author just gets it. They've gotten inside your head and they've put words to things that you're feeling and experiences that you're going through and you feel understood. And the idea that I could maybe be doing that for other women is really just the absolute neatest part of the whole process. I think my readers with this book will get, um, there's kind of two things that make this one different from my other books. Um, well, there's the, the sort of same idea of, I like that it's a little bit of an outsider looking in perspective. So they're going to, it seems this world of celebrity culture and fame and all the trappings that go with it, I think is something that seems really sexy and glamorous and fun from the outside. And I imagine the, the private planes and uh, the ridiculous parties probably fit that pretty well. But, you know, it's the kind of thing I imagine that when you actually are involved in it and you've got paparazzi staking out your apartment and you have these tabloid smear campaigns and you don't have a shred of privacy left to yourself anymore, you're sort of faced with a totally different reality. Um, that's something that, that Brooke is dealing with in the book. So there's the, that part of it, but it's also beyond the sort of celebrity aspect of it. It's really a story of a marriage and it's a story of a marriage that began like any other marriage. Married for five years, she's working as a nutritionist, he's trying to make it in the music industry, she's working two jobs to support him, and I think that's something a lot of my readers will be able to relate to. You know, you don't need to be a celebrity to kind of understand what it's like trying to make this work and doing your best, and then something comes along. In this case, it's Julian's overnight success, but something comes along that derails you and derails sort of what you had imagined your future would look like, and it's how do you put the put the pieces together again. You know, even if it's a good thing, even if it's something you wanted, you've both worked for for so long, it doesn't look the way you necessarily expected it to.